Hello? Hi, Ron Fuller Welch, the Tennessee stud. Yes, sir. How, How are you doing? Great. How are you? Uh, this is Robin Slim from the Robin Slim Show. Okay. Thank How you very much for for getting in touch with me and having me on. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, what was it like being born into a legendary wrestling family? Well, I guess it's a pretty good thing. Um, I went to my first wrestling match when I was nine days old. Uh, don't remember <laughs> much of it. But um, my granddad was wrestling, and he had two brothers wrestling with him in a six-man tag. Uh, that's probably in 1948, somewhere in that time frame. And, you know, uh, my grandfather started in 1924. Wow. Uh, was uh, trained uh, by the legendary Dutch Mantel. Not the, not the Dutch Mantel that a lot of people know, but the original Dutch Mantel. No shooter from out in Texas years and years ago. And and I went from there to Columbus, Ohio, and started wrestling professionally uh, because Dutch news people are the promoters in Ohio. And it was one of the first territories in the in the country. Um, they actually had two territories in Ohio. Um, uh, wow. Did, were you always like growing up? Did you always have people trying to get in close with you just to get a little like a break? Uh, you know, I, growing up as a kid, I got a lot of uh, crap from a lot of people, you know, yeah. because uh, I was a wrestler's son. So, yeah. you know, I had to deal with that in high school uh, all the way through from seventh grade, well, basically probably from about the fourth grade up through, uh, through high school. Wow. And, uh, after high school, I, I gained a little weight, and I, and I started, uh, I, my dad had always taught me to shoot from way back, from uh, well, to the age of about six years old. He had us wrestling, me and my brother wrestling all the time, so they I got knew. to be a pretty decent wrestler, and I put on some weight, and I was a bigger guy, and, and people quit messing with me, yeah. quit questioning me. You were the biggest in your family, right? Uh, six foot nine and 265 pounds. Yeah. Yep, biggest biggest in the family. Uh, I have a son that's taller than I am. Wow. Uh, he's actually 6'10", but uh, he's not as big. But, uh, yeah, come, uh, and, you know, I guess the last generation, my brother, I have a brother that's 6'5". I got a cousin named Jimmy Golden, great oh. wrestler. Uh, he's about 6'5". So I, I outgrew them a little bit. I'm a little <laughs> bigger than they are. <laughs> a little better, a little better than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe two. I don't know. I don't want to say that. Uh, no. My brother and I always have a big discussion about who's the real Tennessee stud. So he might want to question that. But, but uh, he knows as well as I do who the real stud is. <laughs> yes. yes. Ron, I'm curious. So, so when you were a kid and you were getting picked on a lot because you were a wrestler's son, like what was it that made people make fun of you? Like was like, it just like a me, weird profession? or were you? I was thinking like you, you, you think you're so special because like, you, you come from that, that line. Uh, well, you know, what happens is they, they know you're a wrestler, you're a wrestler's son. And yeah. what they used to do is say, uh, and it was not the people usually in my class. It was people that were in a couple of years older than I was and they would want to try you. They would oh. say, Oh yeah, your daddy's a wrestler. How about you? You know, show me what you got. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, show so me. they yeah. could brag like, Oh, I beat the wrestler's yeah. son. <laughs> I was thinking though, your dad would just show up and just, <laughs> just drop him yeah. right through a table. Well, what was funny about it? Uh, my dad, I, I took, I, I took the issue to him when I was in about the third grade. And I said, you know, dad, I'm having problems in school. And he says, what's that all about? And I said, well, you know, they all wanting to wrestle me. <laughs> and, uh, so he says, okay. He says, I'm going to show you three holes. And uh, so I said, okay, yeah, that'd be great. Show me three holes. So first one, he said, you know, he says, when you wrestle on the schoolyard, he said, I bet they want to get you in a headlock. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, yeah, yeah, they want to get your head, right? Either on the front face lock you, headlock you. So he said, uh, they, they get a headlock on you? And he says, yeah, I'll show you what to do. So, you know, I was really small. Uh, but he crotched me between the legs. I got a headlock on him. He crotched me between the legs, and he picked me up, and and uh, and he was going to drop me on the back of my head, you know. And I said, "Oh no, no, no!" I screamed at him, but he says, "No, that's what you got to do." He says, "You pick them up you and you do. drop them right on the back of their heads." Wow. And, uh, <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so the next couple of days, I went to school, and I had one of those deals where I was challenged, and the kid got the headlock, and I dropped him on his head, and I went straight to the principal. <laughs> that kid, oh, your, your dad is not, like, <laughs> thinking, like, there's no <laughs> ring mats out on that, the, the fucking turf out there. That was like my dad. Out, you know? He taught me, like, just, palm strikes. He's like, yeah, oh, just palm God. strike a kid in the, in the mouth. And, yeah, no, that kid needed stitches in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, then he taught me the front face lock. He was a real simple one, too. He says, the front face lock, you just reach up there and put your arm around the back of their head and uh, crotch them right here between the legs and drop them right here, bam, on the top of their head. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so, along till I didn't have problems much in school. After a I was going to say, I like... What what if what if you told your dad you just wanted to be an accountant? Would he have, would he have, would he have dropped you? <laughs> I don't know. He might he might have pulled out his 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 pens and pencils and started teaching me something there. Uh, <laughs> so your dad was kind of like a jack of all trades. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. would encourage you to do what you want to do. But you uh, you did some amazing things. You uh, you ran your own company, uh, your own wrestling company, and you you had a lot of talent come up with you like you you i heard you say um andre the giant and hulk hogan came came up with you right yeah yeah uh well my first wrestling company i i started my first wrestling company in uh 1974 i was i was 20 uh 26 years old and uh and then i had a lot of wrestling friends i had spent my first four years wrestling in florida I came up with guys like Dick Slater, uh, Bob Orton Jr., uh, Mike Graham, uh, just a tremendous number of young guys. And once I got my own company up, they, they wanted to come wrestle for me. You know, we were friends, and, and I liked them. They had great talent. They were all very talented guys, and, and I was lucky to bring in those type of guys. And, and uh, then later on, uh, with my second company, Southeastern, uh, that was in 1978. I started with it, and uh, Hulk Hogan was one of the guys that came there, worked for me. Uh, heck, I've started in my companies. Uh, Honky Tonk Man started with me. Arn Anderson started with me. Uh, Hulk Hogan started with me. Brutus the Barber Beefcake started with me. All those guys got their start working for me wow. in uh, the 70s and the 80s. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Did you ever um, like pass on somebody? that you, looking back, you shouldn't have? Oh, yeah, probably so. Uh, I have passed a lot of guys along, great stars, uh, to other wrestlers. Uh, Sylvester oh. Ritter. I, do you know who Sylvester Ritter is? No. Junkyard Dog. Junkyard Dog. Junkyard. Sylvester Ritter came to wrestle for me in my first wrestling company. Wow. Uh, stayed there about three weeks. He was very talented. And uh, I didn't have a good spot for him, but I really liked him. He had a great attitude. So I called a friend, a guy that had uh, been a personal friend for a long, long time, Bill Watts. And he was running in Oklahoma and in Louisiana and Mid-South. And I said, I, I got a black guy for you that I think is going to be a huge star. And he said, send him to me. And uh, he called me about three weeks later, and he says, Ron. <laughs> He goes, this guy's amazing. He goes, man, Dude. I'm going to change his name. I'm going to call him the Junkyard Dog. Dude. And I said, hey, that would be a great gimmick for him, man. So, uh, he you, was, know, that you never know. Yeah. You never really know who's going to be he, good. He was one of my favorites growing up. Like, I always loved Junk JYD. He was always one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a great guy, too, and a tremendous athlete and a tremendous wrestler, too. Uh, so, yeah, you never know who you're going to. Who you going to see? Uh, I'm sure I had a lot of guys come through that I didn't push properly. They mm -hmm. went somewhere else and made it. But uh, yeah. I was really lucky to have a lot of young guys come through. Uh, Jerry Stubbs, Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Since you know J-O-I-D, you surely know <laughs> Mr. Olympia. Yes. He started with me. He's wow. another guy that started with me that uh, we turned into a big star uh, with Continental Lab. This was my third wrestling company. So I... I built uh, actually four wrestling companies in my career. From uh, such a young age, like I, I feel like I would have screwed up. I would have screwed up majorly <laughs> at that. You said you started at 26, correct? Yeah, yeah 26, 26 years old and uh, just out of college. Played basketball at the University of Miami cool. uh, in college. And uh, after college, uh, 
uh, wrestled in Florida for about four years and uh, and started my first company. Wow. wow. Went to Tennessee, yeah. Knoxville, Tennessee, a uh, little old area in East Tennessee that had never been anything but one wrestling town and within two years turned it into a territory. Uh, a lot of people say it was the best small territory ever in wrestling, NWA territory, smallest NWA territory. I got in the NWA and... In a, at 26 years of age with my own company oh my and God. was in it until the 80s, way into the 80s. That's, so, that's amazing. Ron, I'm curious, being a guy that's been around for so long, what is your opinion um, on the current state of wrestling? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, <laughs> well uh, it's hard for me to watch. You know, I have mm -hmm. a very difficult time. I, I still do some things and I, I make appearances at matches and uh, and there's a lot of old timers that are out there that's, that do that. Uh, but boy, I have a real hard time watching it. I just, it's just, uh, it's not, it's not even similar to the product that was there in the sixties, the seventies and the eighties. There's no comparison, mm. uh, and what they do today and what they did back in those days. Uh, it's, it's all changed because of the training. It's the way they train wow. them. And, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, back in the old days, it was all based around psychology. You, it wasn't, and, and you knew, had to know some wrestling. You know, nowadays, so there's not a lot of wrestling anymore. Moves. They all want to fly now. Yeah. It's all how many bumps you can take, how many false finishes you can kick out of, how many holes you can kill by getting up from them. You know, and it's just a, it's a totally different ball game than what it was in the old days. Are you saying there was more skill involved back more, then? More technical. Like wrestling. Yes, yes, yes. Much more skill involved. Uh, guys in the back in the old days uh, came from uh, shooters. Uh, you know, a lot of back in my granddad's day, they were all shooters. My father's day, they were seventy percent shooters. By the time I was around, there was thirty percent shooters. And nowadays, there's no shooters. What are shooters? Uh, what What is that? You no, know, there's nobody really that knows how to wrestle. The, and uh, the real. You know, so once you learn how to wrestle, then you've got to deal with how to how to call a match and, and uh, the psychology of, of uh, incorporating the fans into your match, uh, knowing what you need to do to get those people involved. Uh, and, uh, you know, back in those days, I remember having a lot of matches in my early years in Florida with Johnny Valentine and guys like that. And we were doing hours. We were doing these one hour matches uh, three times a week. And uh, when you do that, you really, really learn how to wrestle and you learn how to how to connect with the crowd and you learn how to how to work those people so that they yeah. have a they have a great time and they really get into it. I feel like nobody can eat gold that long nowadays. Yeah. It's like five minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm bored. Yeah, yeah. I'm bored. You don't do it. You don't see that anymore. But, uh, you know, it wasn't. It was it wasn't uncommon. Uh, Jack Briscoe was in Florida and that that during that time frame. Dory Funk Jr. was the champion, and uh, they were doing these hour Broadways, hour matches uh, two, three times a week. And uh, like I said, I was one of the unlucky guys that got a, got hooked in with Johnny Valentine, and Johnny Valentine liked to wrestle for at least an hour. He couldn't do it in less than 45 minutes. He told the guy, he told the guy I wanted to give us a finish one night. He, the guy says, yeah, Johnny, I just need 20 minutes. And he said, oh, bullshit. He goes, I can't do it in 20 minutes. He goes, I won't do it in 20 minutes. I'm not even warmed up in 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, it was just totally different than what wow. it is now. Yeah. So, so nowadays they just skip the wrestling and go straight to the character straight and the story. Show and, yeah, yeah, the showboating. Like, yeah. And, uh, yeah. They yeah, might as well just so turn it into a TV show about a couple of guys that sit around a table and talk about <laughs> when they wrestled each other. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know, and, and, and you know, the, back in the day, we had, we, we worked angles and programs, and uh, we, you know, we had storylines that went on for months and months. Yeah. Uh, with my Continental Company, I had Bob Armstrong and his four sons, and uh, my brother and I, and Jimmy Golden, my cousin, uh, the stud stable, we had the stud stable against the bullet and his, his gang of sons, and we carried that on for five years. We had a five year program that, that just continually sold out yeah. night after night after night, city after city, yeah. all over the South, and just uh, basically two families going at it. Wow, it's Hatfields and McCoys. God 
Yeah. Yep, so I'm similar to that. Yeah. I think they're all Southern guys too, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ron, did you know? Did you know Harley Race? Oh yeah, very very well. Loved Harley Race. Wow. Worked with him. I worked with him ten times. I had, I had nine world championship matches with Harley in a Texas Death match. You know, and uh, uh, Harley was a fantastic worker and a great guy. Yeah. Uh, tough, tough guy. Really. Uh, yeah, he really could kick some ass. That's what I was gonna say. He, he looked he like the guy it. that would really he would really hurt you if he yeah, had to. Yeah, he could he could really get it done if he needed to. And uh but it was a great guy. Uh I set a lot of records with Harley. Uh set records in the Knoxville, Tennessee, the the first place that I started my first company in nineteen seventy seven. We do the biggest crowd ever in the history of that Coliseum in Knoxville. It's still a record. And they never broke it. Uh and uh, I think the fire marshal didn't show up that night. And they allowed people to sit in the aisleways. It was like, I'd never what? seen that many people. It was like, oh, I'm man. amazing. You know, it couldn't, people couldn't walk up and down to get drinks because they couldn't get there. You know, it was just uh, crazy. But uh, yeah, Harley was a tremendous, tremendous champion. Great guy, He too. seemed like a yes anytime I ever watch any footage or just when he passed this last summer, just seeing the, the tributes to him, it was like, wow, he just seemed like the best, the best guy ever. Oh. Got a lot of uh, a lot of those old-time world champions, man. I wrestled uh, every world champion as far back as Gene Kaninsky. Gene Kaninsky was, <clears throat> he was back uh, in the 60s. World champion in the 60s. I've wrestled Luthez four times. You know, I mean, uh, Pat O'Connor three times. I mean, world champions from way, way back uh, uh, up to modern day guys. Wow. So, what was the, the most recent guy that, that you wrestled? Uh, the, the real world champion would be Flair. Wow. Um, I wrestled uh, Flair. God, I wrestled Flair probably. 25 times maybe you know a heck of a lot of times <laughs> and a lot of different parts of the country uh st louis we used to uh, out of florida go into st louis and flair was young back in that day too yeah and we used to wrestle each other there uh terry funk the funks both those guys tremendous tremendous stars uh just really had a opportunity to to wrestle some of the best that, that ever got in the ring from sure. all from every era it sounds what is um what is the nastiest injury you've ever seen in the ring the nastiest injury i've ever had is uh and uh and i do a program called a stud cast i yes. have a podcast called a stud cast and i'm actually in that time frame 1975 i had a wrestler drop me on my head uh and i'd my my chin connected with my collarbone where the sternum is down the center of your chest and drove the drove my uh sc joint drove the collarbone out of my sc joint down into my chest and uh, i was out for about three months uh pretty horrible injury uh they told me i'd never wrestled again when i went to the hospital they wow. said you'll never be back in the ring again uh, but uh, three months later i was back in i was back at it but and I still have a collarbone that you can look at it and see that it's not like it should be. But, uh, yeah. you know, I've seen some horrible injuries, obviously, man. Broken legs. I've seen a lot of broken legs and broken bones and yeah. uh, just uh, stitches, bad cuts, and mm. things like that. Uh, it's it was it was tough game, man. It yeah. was it was really tough at times. Yeah, it is. That that that's the the, the game though. That's the game, and it comes along with it. Uh, I feel. I'm curious curious if you know any wrestlers uh, personally who had to retire because of injuries. Oh, Jason, I'm sure there are some, and I I don't think I can't think of anybody right offhand instantly, but. Uh, Gosh, there are a lot of guys that got hurt and had to leave way, way before their time was was there. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it just uh, you had to take care of yourself. You had to watch out for yourself, uh, and it was really important to to uh, not give your body to somebody you couldn't trust with it. You had to be able to trust your opponent not to hurt you. Yes. And, so you uh, would turn down matches then if you were like, yeah, no, I don't trust this guy at all. Like, yeah, yeah. Come I mean, you, yeah, you, you. I went in the ring a lot of times with guys you never knew. I mean, when you would travel from one territory to another, 
you would you would be in the ring with guys you did not even uh, that you didn't had never seen, had no knowledge of, and and you were uh, you were always putting your your body on the line. Yeah, in that situation you never knew uh, what they knew. That was the problem. I've heard you too, know, like yeah, like just care. just training with a, a new guy might be a real problem. Like if oh, he wow. thinks it's real in his head and he's just doing some crazy stuff, and and it's not it's not what should be done. Yeah, it would, back in the old days in uh, Florida, they had a they, where they had a <laughs> the office. They had a ring that set up there all the time. They did their televisions there out of Tampa, and uh, they had what was called the Snake Pit. I don't know if guys have ever heard of that, but that was a they brought in uh, Matt Suda, Bob Roop, uh, Don Curtis, uh, a lot of different guys. I I used to go down there and hang out in the old snake pit. And that was not a good place to be. They broke Hulk Hogan's leg his first time yes, he was there. Yes, yes. Uh, they tried to keep him from be, continuing his wrestling career, and they broke his leg on purpose. Yes. Matt Suda did. Wow. So, uh, yes. You know, there was, there was some nasty places to be. But uh, you know, it was good. It was important. I felt like it was important to know how to to know how to hurt people if you needed to. And uh, you know, you didn't have a lot of problems in the ring when you when they when they heard you were in the snake bit for a couple of years. They were they weren't going to uh, give you a problem. That's for damn sure. <laughs> nice, uh, Ron. I want to ask. Um, you did mention the studcast. Where and where can it be found? And how long have you been doing it? I've been doing it, uh, just did today, uh, episode number 120 came out today. That's awesome. I started uh, two years ago, a little more than two years ago. And my, my, my stud cast is a little different than the other podcasts. It's all about my family's history. I started with my grandfather, 1902, when he was born, taught, talked about how he got in it, uh, who trained him. Then I went, went through my father. And now I'm into my career, and I'm I'm into the actually about to finish my very first year as a promoter, as an owner of a company, wow. about to go into 1976. And uh, you can find it at uh, tnstud.com. That happens to be my website too. If people like to go there, uh, or you can find it at iTunes, uh, Fuller Pod, uh, anywhere you find podcasts. Uh, it's Ron Fuller's uh, Studcast. It's called and. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, a, a tremendous audience. Uh, we got a lot, a lot of WWE. And uh, I didn't like where wrestling was headed. I heard so, uh, so some bad stuff about him back in the day. I heard, I heard a lot of bad stuff about uh, Vince uh, forcing people to do steroids and all that. I, I heard a oh. lot of bad stuff back in the day. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, it's... It's not the same sport it was. It's it's so dramatically different. It's 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 unbelievable. And for an old timer like me and a guy that was there, uh, wrestled in the from 1970 to 88. Uh, before I got in hockey, I actually bought myself a hockey team. I got <laughs> really? I got a franchise for a hockey team after I got out of wrestling yes. for twenty five thousand dollars in a in a East Coast Hockey League, which is the smallest. It's the biggest hockey league in the country nowadays. Uh, bought a franchise for 25, and uh, and we drew more money. We did things in hockey that nobody had ever seen before. Well, I mean, we we darkened the lights and and introduced the players and played bad to the bone. And oh, I mean, we just we and we totally changed that sport. Uh, my partner and I and uh, and uh, drew the biggest crowds. We still hold the records in minor league hockey. All-time records in two cities, wow. uh, Nashville and Cincinnati, Ohio. I had two teams. You tore oh, it up, amazing. Ron. You tore it up in two, <laughs> two sports industries. I love it. I love it. So okay. I feel like your advice to the young guy that wants to get into pro wrestling get is into get, get into hockey. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That would probably be my advice. <laughs> you know, you know, especially if you can skate. You know, right. yeah. Learn to I mean, skate, skate, motherfucker, and <laughs> hockey. Learn to skate, you young piece of garbage. I bought, I bought, a, I bought, I bought into a hockey <laughs> franchise, and I'd never seen a live game. <laughs> That's amazing! I love wow, it. 
Well, thank you, Ron. It into a monster of a success. I mean, uh, the, everybody in the league, that league went from $25,000 for franchise fee to a million within five years. Yes. It was like, wow. It is, and it was all because they get, kept going, look what they're doing in Nashville and Cincinnati. They're drawing 10,000 people a game. You oh, know? my so God. That's they, amazing. They made a lot of money. All the owners made a lot of money off of that. <sighs> Great. Ron, thank you so much for talking to us. It has been an, an absolute honor. honor and pleasure, my friend. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, guys. And uh, good luck with what you do. And um, uh, I listen to you myself, guys. So, you know, uh, thank you. just uh, keep up the good work. You too, Thanks, man. I, I I I love listening to your show, and I I can't help but smile at some of the stories. Like you you do you do an amazing podcast, my friend. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll we'll talk soon, Ron. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good thank one. Thank you. Have a good one.